Hello everyone. All right, we're going to be reading chapters two and three today from our Pay It Forward book. This is Luna here. He is my middle daughter. Her, she was her birthday. She turned eight yesterday and she got a little bunny. Totally looks like the Easter bunny, I think. Um, and she was born on Easter Sunday, so you can tell why she likes bunnies. Anyways, I thought that Luna here would like to hear the story. You might hear some noises in the background. My husband's trying to work on the boat and it sounds like grinding. So <laughs> sorry for the background noise. Okay, chapter two is Arlene. Um, remember how last time I told you that chapters are written by different characters in the book? Um, so Arlene is Trevor, the 12 year old boy that we met last time. His, her is Arlene, his mom, okay? Ricky never exactly came home. Not like she thought he would, but the truck did. Only not like she thought it would. It had been rolled a few times. All in all, it looked worse than she felt. Only it ran, well, it idled. It's one thing to start up and run, quite another thing to actually get somewhere. As much as she resented that Ford, that Ford extra cab for imitating her own current condition, she could have forgiven that, it that. Potentially she could. It was the way it kept her up at night, especially now that she'd taken a second job at Laser Lounge to keep up the payments. And since it was the truck's fault that she didn't get to go to bed until three, it at least could have let her sleep. Surely that would have not been too much to ask for. Yet there she was again at the window, double checking the way moonlight slid off the vehicle's spooky shape the way its silvery reflection broke where the paint broke. Only Ricky could mess up a truck that bad and then walk away. At least it would stand to reason that he had walked away, seeing that the truck was found and Ricky was not. At this point in time, you should be asking yourself, who's Ricky? Why is he important to this story? And maybe make a prediction why, um, who he is. Right now, I'm just, my cat is walking underneath me and I don't want it to scare the bunny rat out. Anyways, dragged off by coyotes, she thought. Stop, Arlene, get a hold of yourself. Unless, of course, he limped away, not sauntered off, maybe dragged himself to a hospital, maybe got out okay, maybe died far from anything to tie him to a Ford extra cab, far from any ties to hometown news. So there could be a grave somewhere. But how would Arlene know? And even if she did, she could not know which one or where even if she brought flowers for Ricky out of her tip money, she and her boy Trevor would never know where to put them. Flowers can be a bad thing, a bad thought, if you don't even know where to lie them down. Just stop, Arlene. Just go back to bed. So you can see Arlene is struggling emotionally and with her thoughts, and it's keeping her up at night, right? As she did, but she fell into a victim of a dream where Ricky had been living just outside the town for months and months and never even bothered to contact her about his whereabouts, which made her cross to the window again to blame that darn truck for keeping her up awake. From the Diary of Trevor. Here we are, sorry, this side. So again, this is the Diary of Trevor and we're not hearing from Trevor himself, but we're hearing from the other characters. Sometimes I think my father never went to Vietnam. I don't even know why I think that, I just do. Joe's father went to Vietnam and he tells stories and you can just tell by the stories that he really did go. I think my father maybe just says some things sometimes that he thinks will make people proud of him or feel sorry for him. My mom feels sorry for him because he went to Vietnam. She says no wonder he has problems. So I don't tell her that I think maybe he never actually went there. Mr. St. Clair is so cool. I don't care what Arnie says. I think he's great. And I'm gonna do such a great job on that assignment. Mr. St. Clair won't even be able to believe it. Okay, so we're kind of thinking about the way he thinks of his dad and then the way he thinks of his teacher. All right, chapter three, Jerry. Here's a new character. He didn't know if it was nine o'clock yet, but it seems like it must be. 48 people were gathered on the corner, not counting himself. 
A boy, 12, 13 years old, rode up on a bike, an old beach cruiser. Jerry was surprised that there won't, weren't more kids waiting because kids liked free money, along with everybody else. But the kid didn't act like he had come to wait. The kid looked at the crowd. The crowd looked at him, maybe because he was the only one so far who didn't keep his eyes down on the pavement. He didn't look like he fit there. I wonder who this 12 or 13 year old boy might be. The kid's eyes scanned all around like he was counting. His forehead furrowed down into a frown. Then he said, holy cow, are you all here for the ad? He said it in a kind of official way and some heads came up listening to him, sort of, thinking he might know something. And a few people nodded. Holy cow, he said again, he shook his head. I only wanted one guy. Jerry walked up to the kid, nice, humble, not like to scare him. He said, you did that ad? Yeah, I did. And almost everyone left. Whether that meant that they thought that there was no money or that they wouldn't take it from a kid, Jerry didn't know. The kid just stood there a while, kind of relieved, Jerry thought, because now there were only 10 or 11 left. A little more manageable crowd. Jerry asked, so is it a joke? No, it's for real. I got a paper route and I make $35 a week and I wanna give it to somebody who'll like get a job and not need it after a while just to get them started, you know, like food and something better to wear and some bus fare or whatever. Okay, so when you were thinking about, um, or maybe make a connection to what you learned about in poverty, in social studies, he talked about kind of the barriers of getting out of that poverty cycle. And so that's what he's saying, right? Like maybe food, something better to wear for an interview, bus fare to get to an interview. And somebody behind Jerry, some voice over his shoulder said, yeah, but which somebody? Yeah, that was the problem. The kid thought this over for a bit. And then he said he had some paper in his book bag and he asked everybody to write out why they thought it should be them. And when he said that, six people left. Kid said, I wondered what happened to them. And the lady with no front teeth, she said, what makes you think everyone can write? It was clear from the look on the kid's face that he would have never thought of that. Then we have uh, italicized writing there, and it's from Jerry looks like his essay of why he thinks he deserves the money. So it says, why I think I deserve the money by Jerry Bascani. Well, for starters, I will say, I will not say that I would deserve it better than anybody because who is to say? I am not a perfect person and maybe somebody else will say that they are. And you are a smart kid, I bet you are. You will know that they are handing you a line. I am being honest. Me, I have some problems sometimes. This is my own fault, nobody else's. I lost some stuff because of my problems. A car, even though it was not a very good one. And my apartment. And then I went to jail. And they did not hold my job for when I got out. But I got lots of things I can do. I got skills. I have worked in wrecking yards and in body shops. And I have even worked as a mechanic. I am a good mechanic. It's not that I'm not. But used to you could get you could go in kind of scruffy and dirty for a mechanics job nobody would mind but now times is hard and guys show up for the same job just good and even some of them have a state license so then they say fill out this form which i can do because as you can see i can read and write pretty good but then they say put down your number we'll call you if you get the job but the dumpster where i've been saying ain't got a phone so I say, I'm just getting settled in. And they say, okay, put your address then. We'll send you a postcard. And then they know that you are on the street. And I guess they figure you got problems and stuff that they don't know nothing about. And well, I guess I do, like I said. But if I had a chance at a job now, I would not mess it up like I had done before. It would be different this time. Anyway, if you go with me, you won't be sorry. I guess that's all I have to say. Also, thank you. I never knowed no kid who gave money away. I had a job at your age and I spent the money on me. 
You must be a good kid. I guess that's all for now. Thanks for your time. When Jerry looked up after writing his letter, everybody else except the kid had gone. So I want you to make a prediction. Do you, who do you think is going to get this money? What does this have to do with the story? Why is Trevor getting people to, um, or getting people to apply for his money? And he wants to help people that can't help themselves, but just for a little while. So I want you to make some connections to what you've already learned in class before. And then we will hear from you another time, but I thought maybe you would like a little close up of little Miss Luna. Say hi, Luna. Isn't she cute? She's so sweet. Okay, bye guys.